Sherryverse, um, the cool stuff they do, so the whole community can level up together. Um, thank you. Uh, so first, let me have, let me invite Manish to share about how he powers up a super app with data science. Manish is uh, head of data science at Gojek, and take it away, Manish. Thanks, Eugene. One correction: I don't power the whole data science team does, um, and. I think we have a pretty stellar team who would be presenting later on. So, yeah. Cool. Um, let me start off with, you know, why we call this a super app, right? I mean, you keep hearing about apps, but now we are calling Gojek as a super app. And one testimony to the fact is the journey that it has been through, how it started off as a, you know, small bike hailing company, uh, bike sharing company, and then how it expanded its use cases. Right, so I'll just take you through some of the journey around that, um, how we actually use machine learning in the team, and how we power some of the features that you see and end, using, end up using. So as a company, I think the mission is to use technology for a social mission, right? At, that's at the heart of what we do. The social mission is to actually provide Means of, I mean, means of livelihood for a lot of Indonesians. That's how it started. And now as we grow across Southeast Asia, we carry the same mission, right? And something to note here is how we have unlocked the potential of this informal sector. That's mind blowing and I'll share some numbers about it later. So that's at the heart of what Project does. We also have GoPay. The aim over there is financial inclusivity, how we can provide payment uh, gateways, how we can actually become an alternative to what a bank account is for many for many Indonesians, right? Where the bank account is not uh, is not that popular, and it almost replaces what an account is for people. So, as I said, at the heart of it is driver well-being, right? And that's what the social enterprise is about. So, in in terms of impact, right? If you look at what we have been able to achieve in Indonesia, is we have been able to drive the average income of that country up by providing or unlocking these opportunities for people. Alongside that, we have given the customers uh, a aha experience, and that's what we strive for. We have close to, I mean, we, we provide earnings to close to 2 million plus drivers who use the platform almost every day. What started off as a bike sharing company, as I said, exploded into a bunch of other use cases. So, I mean, there's a very limited set being represented here. So, uh, we have over 18 plus services, but just to give you a few examples, so you can order food, you can order groceries, you can order beverages, you can get your car repaired, you can get your house cleaned, you can also get a massage, and if that was not enough, you can also get a makeup done at your home itself. So, what all this means is that we have seen phenomenal growth over the past three years. 125 million plus bookings per month, a scale of 6600x growth in a matter of three years is not many companies can claim. And to the extent that every second person in Indonesia actually uses Gojek, right? And that means the scale that we serve them for, we have to maintain uh, a lot of reliability across the systems. We have to power them with a lot of machine learning and a lot of data science, how we can actually automate and, you know, make all this possible, even with a very lean setup. So one thing about Gojek, if you see, is that it's, it's a very, um, efficient in terms of what the people produce. So almost the entire tech is maintained by around 250 engineers. And that's, again, I mean, if you look at it from a per person's impact perspective, we always take pride in saying every person literally con contributes around half a million trips in a month. So how we actually use machine learning in some of these uh, applications and various services. So here I am giving one example for a single service. So as you open the app, right, I mean, you will have a bunch of services which are customized based on your location, your hour of the day, and we do some pre-ranking 
logic over there to surface the needs that you have so that it's easy for you to discover the services. I don't think many companies can say that they have this kind of a challenge where it's hard to find out what service to do. So that's a pretty unique problem that we try and solve. Once you get to that and then you enter an actual service, you, will ha you are now having I mean, undergoing this anxiety of choice because you have almost a million dishes to choose from. Here I'm giving an example of GoFood while you are trying to order food. So we use shuffle cards. These are some infinitely scrollable lists where we pre-populate them based on your ordering history. Right? And we use a bunch of recommendation engines uh, for merchants and surfacing those relevant content to you. And relevance is at the heart of uh, when we try to you know, uh, customize the feed. Now, once you have selected your merchant and you have found the merchant, now comes the next part where you need to actually price it right. And you have to consider your supply, your demand, uh, a bunch of other features. And then you have to basically, you know, what we call in the uh, terminology of right sharing as surge to, to have, the, have the right price set to that. Of course, there are a lot of bad actors as well. Um, many people try and game the system, uh, abuse the system, so we have to keep those checks and balances in place as well, which is where we try and detect fraud, uh, make out who are the real users, who are the fake ones, and just cut down the usage in general, and that's the risk scoring part. Then comes the part of allocation, which drivers to allocate that job to, so that that booking gets completed and we want to maximize, because that really comes in the way of an experience, right? A good experience. So we want to maximize that as well. Now once that is done and the delivery partner has been assigned, we move on to, you know, uh, if there is a bad experience, someone might raise a ticket, and we want to reduce that time to resolution of a ticket, right? So we use some automation over there and do pre-filtering and prioritization logic. After that, once the order is completed, then you know we want to see how we can make the user come again and again, so that it actually becomes a habit, and also try and see how we can predict the LTV, because that's pretty business critical, right? How we spend, how we retain people. So that's an example of one service. If you look at the entire spectrum of data science problems at Gojek, it's pretty huge. So since it starts off with a matchmaking company, so there is a supply and demand side to everything that we do. So to, to just illustrate the fact that you know marketplace is that central team which tries and manage or you know uh, make it very efficient how supply and demand uh, interact with each other. So we try to put them together and try to balance those forces. The supply side of Workstream works more on supply positioning, identifying some fraudulent activities, and preventing churn. The marketplace team, with, I mean, uh, you would hear from them later on in the talk, uh, works on allocation or dispatch models, what should be the search, uh, how we can enhance some of the experience. They also monitor health of a city in terms. Then you look at the demand side, and we try and use a lot of automation to allocate vouchers, how we can be very efficient in our spend, and also try to understand the persona of our customers. So unless we understand why people use Gojek, we will never be able to you know, give them the best experience, and in the spirit of personalization as well, that's a huge input. Right? Then we also try and reduce churn on the demand side. So now, I mean, transport is the one big focus area because that's a gateway to a lot of other services, so that's the primary focus. So if you look at food, it's always about personalization, it's about discovery, it's about ranking items. So those are some of the efforts over there. We also have a huge team dedicated purely on payment, uh, where they try and uh, look at how we can increase the offline payment space, how we can reduce uh, some of the fraudulent activities which happen because there is a lot of abuse which happens on promos. And we also are into the lending business, so there is some credit risk models which also we try and build. Apart from that, we have some specific pretty niche uh, work streams which are around fraud. How do we, I mean, like every other service has a possibility of, uh, you know, encountering fraud and fraudsters keep uh, changing their strategies, so we have to really be on the eye for them and how we can automate, how we can use 
uh, AI or ML to, to surface those. MAPS is another initiative where we try and use um, a lot of open source maps that we have and try to get, uh, get, get the right routing, get the right ETAs, because all of those are pretty important for a reliable experience, right? Um, we have some streams working on ops. Platform is a big one. Uh, here we have a pool of machine learning engineers whose single aim is to make data scientists effic uh, efficient and effective and how they can reduce all the, uh, you know, uh, how they can make their, make the life of a data scientist easier. So there is a lot of uh, systems they build. Uh, XP is also an effort towards having an experiment experimentation platform because Behind every product feature rollout, we have a ton of experiments which happen. And if those experiments are not carefully ironed out, they are not uh, properly measured, there is always a risk of uh, making a bad decision. So that's, that's the efforts towards experimentation platform. Topic speakers for the day. So first we'll have, uh, if you remember, the marketplace team. So we'll have Jawad and Peter talk about how we match our riders and drivers. Second, we have Zelay. So she comes from the platform team. So how we build complex machine learning flows. And she will talk a bit more about that. Uh, we have Jere who is here for uh, the growth and you know well-being of the team and how we can better organize ourselves. And that's a topic which is probably not touched upon a lot, is how we can avoid burnout in data science and how we can be more efficient. I leave you with one video. Safri, uh, <laughs> where are you? <laughs> okay, so, so Safri, Safri leads the team in Jakarta. Uh, sorry, I forgot to mention. So we have a team in Singapore as well, where primarily most of the data scientists are. But then we also have a team in Jakarta and in Bangalore. Um, Siafi leads the uh, Jakarta side of things, and here's a team video. Uh, so just I'm going to leave off with this, and yeah, here you'll see probably the team culture and probably some familiar faces in the crowd. <laughs> So these are the three guiding guiding pillars for us. And we, we really take care of the driver's livelihood here. I mean, that's the well-being of drivers is really at the core of every decision that's taken. So that's something fascinating. I mean, as I said, the company is a social enterprise. That's how it started. So that's something pretty unique given you know all the other players in this space. So that's something which keeps me very motivated. Hi, my name is Safri. I'm a GP of data science at Gojek. I've always been fascinated by math as a subject. And probably one of the reasons is that my father is a high school math teacher. So in a way, math has been in my blood. 
I remember when I was in fourth grade in elementary school and I stumbled upon arithmetic sequence problems where the teacher asked us to solve quite differentiable arithmetic sequence. And being very stubborn, I tried to extend the problem into four times differentiable arithmetic sequence instead. Uh, so I asked for my father for help. However, instead of helping me to solve it, he posed me a math book on the table. And that book was actually for university students and he wanted me to find a solution to myself. Uh, maybe he meant it as a joke, but I actually spent hours reading the book and I got fascinated by a combination of ideas in the book. That was when my interest in math started to grow. So another memorable story about the math Olympiad in high school was when I was hospitalized right before the Southeast Asian Math Olympiad. So I got dengue fever and the doctor turned life he on my right hand. But somehow I still practice uh, by solving math problem with uh, left hand in the hospital. So I feel like uh, when I put my mind on something, I'll just do whatever it takes to get it. So just like when I wanted to pursue a master degree in math uh, overseas, I put my mind to it and I even imagined myself sitting on the grass and soaking the summer vibes in Europe. So I tried to apply it to a lot of different scholarships. And fortunately, I had the chance to go to the University of Twente because I got a scholarship from the Dutch Ministry of Education. Uh, my major was applied mathematics with specialization in financial engineering. After I graduated, I stayed in the Netherlands for nine years. Uh, I worked there as a quant, uh, which is a rather niche profession that rigorously applies mathematics and statistics in solving financial problems. Although in its purest form, quant is actually data science uh, before the term data science has even known and it is applied specifically for financial problems. After working as a quant for a while, I came to realize that the impact I made when I was a quant can't extend much further beyond the company I worked for. I just want to do more. I want to work to benefit a lot of other people. That was when I found out about a big digital movement going on in Indonesia on a very big scale. I still remember the night when I was crossing on LinkedIn. That was when I came across a video of Nadim explaining Gojek's impact and social mission. It started as a five-minute video, and I ended up bashing my keyboard for three hours, researching about data science in Indonesia. That night actually triggered me to go back to Indonesia. Then, I actually went back to Indonesia and eventually joined Gojek. I'm interested in data science because it combines three of my favorite subjects, math, statistic, and engineering, in order to solve real problems. And these are problems that actually matter for people. I think Gojek has a unique position where we have a vast amount of data and as a data scientist, we want to turn natural ingredients into a Michelin star menu. At Gojek, we use data science to unlock actionable insights and enrich our product features from the data. Um, currently, we have three data science hubs at Gojek, of which Singapore and Jakarta being the biggest one. Our data scientists come from different nationalities and backgrounds. And one thing that I really like about having these versatile people at Gojek is that we all come together and try to solve meaningful problems at scale, be that on the whiteboard, through Slack, or during coffee breaks. The problem-solving traits are embodied within us. So being a data scientist might have not always been easy, but we have a lot of helpful colleagues to reach out. Um, if you want to try at Gojek, I think you need to be data vision, a good publisher, creative, and thank you very much. And we need to be able to play hard. Hi, Matt. <laughs> okay, let's give a hand to Siafri. So yeah, I mean, as you see the spectrum of problems, the, the engineering challenges, um, the vast amount of data that we need to process, there is a lot of opportunity to drive impact. And I think we are that's a big motivator for the whole team. So yeah, I mean, no need to put it in a subtle manner, but yeah, uh, we are looking for uh, talent. We are looking for rock stars. Uh, please feel free to reach out to any of us if you want to know more. With that, I think I'll pass over to Peter and Jawad, who will talk about 
uh, how we match our riders and drivers. <coughs> Hello everyone, uh, I'm Jawad. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks Manish for the great introduction and talk. Uh, for this presentation, uh, I've been working in uh, data science marketplace team for about one and a half years and primarily my focus was on solving allocation and pricing related problems. So without further ado, let's just continue with the session. So uh, the agenda of this discussion would be, we'd first start with an introduction to Gojek Marketplace team and the different components involved in Gojek Marketplace team. Uh, after that, we'll look at the formulation of matchmaking problem in Gojek, uh, uh, after which we'll be talking about the allocation system, rank or driver ranking also first generation allocation slash matchmaking system, and Jaeger is the new and improved version of rank. Uh, Peter will be talking about rank later in the session. So, uh, what is Gojek Marketplace? You know that uh, Gojek has at least 18 plus product offerings in Indonesia, but at its heart, Gojek is a, Gojek is a marketplace startup. Uh, the entire objective is to match service providers with service seekers and how we do this is core to our uh, business and critical to our operational efficiency. So let's look at an example of uh, a customer making a go-car booking and I'll walk you through the entire process of how Kojak Marketplace has uh, different activities in the entire state of the transition pipeline. <clears throat> so Marketplace starts working even before you try to book an app. Um, the drivers are shown information regarding the high supply areas so they can use this information to strategically position themselves for better allocation opportunities. And once marketplace, once the customer launches the app uh, and enters the pickup and uh, destination location, the price estimate is computed and shown to the customer. It does, it not only depends on the Road between uh, road distance between the starting and the destination location. It also takes into consideration the dynamic, uh, real world uh, volatile demand demand supply situations in the marketplace, and then adjust your price accordingly for better operational efficiency. <coughs> now, once the customer decides to make a go car booking, uh, the budget marketplace allocation system looks for closest drivers. Um, surrounding the customer and then among those list of drivers tries to choose the best driver for the specific job. So once the driver has ac accepted his booking, uh, Marketplace shows continuously updated information about the estimated arrival time of the driver so you don't have to wait in the pickup location uh, for a long time. So. Essentially, Gojek Marketplace is a combination of all these factors. This entire pipeline happens millions of times a day and every uh, efficient allocation counts. So you can consider Gojek Marketplace as a highly complex machinery 
that takes into consideration the ever-changing real world and acts accordingly to provide the best user experience possible for you. These are not just an exhaustive list of functions in the Gojek Marketplace team, but these are some of the critical ones. Pre-dispatch function refers to any operation that happens before a customer makes a Gojek booking. And pricing is a complex machinery itself where it involves uh, a variation of pricing structures and uh, it takes into consideration the supply demand situation in a given place at a given time and adapts accordingly. So dispatch or matchmaking is nothing but uh, allocating the right drivers to the right customer. And driver incentive is a function that operates to, to keep the drivers incentivized to do the right behavior and uh, keeps them motivated. Today specifically we will be focusing on the dispatch and matchmaking problem at Gojek and let's, go, let's do a deep dive into it. So, uh, what is matchmaking? Matchmaking is nothing but uh, providing the best uh, service provider for a given service seeker, which is our customer. In terms of ride rolling, uh, this is just providing the best driver for the given job. This visualization uh, is what we call the heart of Jakarta, and it's plus. It's completely plotted using Gojek drivers' latitude and longitude information from their phones. And this not only beautifully shows the incoming and outflowing traffic in and out of the central business district of Jakarta over the period of one day, but it also highlights the magnitude of the task involved. There are millions and millions of transactions happening every day in Gojek and especially for a two-wheeler ride booking or a four-wheeler ride booking. And this provides an enormous opportunity to optimize this and create a big impact for our entire operational efficiency of the marketplace. So, why not just use the closest distance, uh, closest driver for the allocation? Let's look at a few uh, interesting scenarios to understand the situation. <coughs> Imagine you are ordering a go car uh, from this specific building at AXA Tower and there is a driver a couple of blocks away from you. The straight line distance or what we call as a crow fly distance is about 300 meters. But in reality, cars don't fly. So uh, this is the road they took to arrive uh, to the AXA Tower and depending upon the traffic conditions, the time may vary between 3 minutes to 5 minutes and so on. So in this specific scenario, you could have chosen a driver who is far away but traveling in the Shenton Bay road and coming towards AXA Tower. This is another interesting example. Uh, this is what we call as a cloverleaf junction and these are very common in Indonesia. As, let's assume that there's a customer here trying to make a, a go-car booking and it finds a driver traveling in uh, this specific direction. Even though the driver is close to the customer, in order for him to reach that specific pickup point, he has to make this complicated sequence of maneuvers and reach the pickup location. So, so these things are just highlighting the complications involved in making a particular uh, match for customers and our riders. So why don't we assign the closest driver to you? These are some of the factors that we consider. So the traffic conditions in certain places are really, really volatile and you have to take them into consideration when you're allocating drivers to customers. And the driver preferences, uh, since Gojek is a multi-service type product, uh, Gojek driver has an option to do a right, uh, a right service or deliver food or any other choice. So certain drivers have certain preferences and they like to capture them during the allocation. Drivers may have favorite locations like uh, at the end of the day, if they want to go back to the home, they don't want to take a ride which leads them to the other end of the city. And customer might have their own preferences. Certain customers are much more uh, patient and are okay to wait for a driver, but certain customers try to cancel the booking if they see that uh, the drivers are too far. 
These are just a few examples, but there are much, much more to consider. So, two things I would like to highlight in this presentation is that the magnitude of the task involved and the number of factors to optimize gives a great potential uh, to make it as a machine learning problem to solve and that's what we did with Drank. <coughs> Drank, a driver ranking system, uh, is the first ML model to be deployed in Gojek and at scale and like a, like a first step, the model was a su simple supervised machine learning model and it has this familiar steps where we, we perform ETL uh, based on the historical data store and initiate a model training. Once the model is trained, we deploy the model in, as a web service for real-time inference. Looks all good. Uh, so although I have masked most of the technicalities involved in this pipeline, it was a pretty sophisticated system and in the sense that we were able to achieve one click deployment uh, for the system and the CI-CD pipelines were automatically integrated with load testing, functional, functional testing components and the model would trigger and train every day, uh, validate the end result of the model training and with the push of a single button deploy into production. So, and we generally used more than 150 features to train the model. Some were location based, driver, uh, driver preferences, customer preferences, their behaviors and so on. Okay, but the entire objective of the model was to improve the operational efficiency of allocation and it just did one thing and it did really well. Once the model was deployed, uh, it was a huge success. It improved uh, the operational efficiency significantly and it also was uh, recognized well with the business users. But what happened? Let's take a look at uh, what happened later. At Gojek, business really changes fast. Things that work well at a given point of time become completely obsolete or useless in a matter of a couple of months. So, at the same point of time, uh, Gojek started expanding to overseas markets outside Indonesia like Singapore, Thailand and Vietnam. And these specific geographies had uh, different objectives and different behavior of drivers. This was a challenging task to accomplish for Drank. And the next biggest problem for Drank was to iterate fast and experiment faster. Most of the time, the offline metrics such as AUC or whatever score we use do not, does not correlate very well or with the, with the real world metrics uh, that we compare to. And even simple situations like adding a single new feature would require enormous change because the entire pipeline from ETL to uh, model training and the web service has to be replaced, right? So the architecture of Drank uh, did its job well, but it had all these tight couplings and it made it really difficult to improve the model, uh, test different modular components and add new features or, or try other different variations of models. And respond to external behavior. Drank wasn't really designed to react fast to external behavior. It had a traditional pipeline in the sense that I trained on historical data and, and what it tried to do was to uh, just optimize a single objective. Some of the external behavior that changes fast, uh, I can give an example of uh, say drivers using fake GPS. The behavior of drivers, uh, even, even when certain fraud teams try to capture the behavior, the behavior changes very fast and these types these of fraudsters do affect the network efficiency. Uh, GPS being spoofed to different location and when you assign the driver to a specific customer, uh, the real arrival times for those drivers are very long. And Drank was simply not designed to solve these types of problems. And we took this time an opportunity to think deeply about uh, certain problems and areas of improvement that we could handle for Drank and those are how we should formulate the problems, the feedback loops involved in training a machine learning model and then deploying it in real world production and some of the manual overrides we wanted to achieve with it. In order to 
to explain these things in detail, I would like to invite Peter to talk about how we uh, converted these problems and address them well in Jaeger. So, Jank uh, yeah. so was, was the history of Kojo. Uh, so, I get the, the more fun job talking about uh, what, what, what we're doing now, what, what the current uh, state of the allocation system is. Uh, so, um, yeah, Jared's already introduced Jaeger. Um, so, that's what we call our new allocation system. Uh, so, what were the things that we, our main objectives, what were the main reasons why we decided we needed to, to, to rebuild? Um, I think Jared's already hinted at a few. We, we needed uh, more flexibility. Um, I think Drank was a very powerful tool. Um, the model did a very good job at what it was intended to do, uh, but it was a little bit like uh, we had a, like a rocket launcher which we were trying to fire blindfolded. You know, it, it, if, we, if we hit the target, it was, there was a lot of luck involved. Uh, so this is kind of the, um, also the reason for, for the name Jaeger. Uh, it's kind of a wasn't wasn't my wasn't my name, but uh, it's um, it's kind of a, it refers to. I think it's a Pacific Rim reference, uh, but it's a guy. It's a guy, something like this, a sort of interface of, of a human and a machine. So we're trying to get the best of machine learning, but keep a lot of flexibility for for human intervention and for to configure the business objectives. Um, yeah. Uh, manually override the model if we need to. Um, yeah. We also needed it to be a lot more responsive. The allocation problem is, is very non-stationary. Um, so we need to train, where, you know, refresh the model very quickly. Uh, we need real-time features into the model. Um, yeah, one, one thing that we've spent a lot of time thinking about is how, how we fair to, to drivers, you know, we don't, we don't want to just, if one driver has a bad day, you know, or, or just has one, you know, one or two cancellations, you know, we don't want them to be deprioritized for the next two weeks or something. So how, how do we make sure we're reactive enough so that we're fair to drivers that are performing well, you know, we should be allocating them more drive, more rides. Um, I think it's very interesting. Um, yeah, so we need to get more real-time features into the model. Uh, uh, and then the next objective was to make it multi-objective. So going from one model uh, to, to many models, each optimizing for different models. Um, so why did we think this was so important? Um, well, partly as Jared has already said, you know, the business is always changing. Um, you know, often from week to week, they, they flip flop and say, no, we should optimize for this, no, we should optimize for this. Uh, if you just have one model, it's very difficult to do that. Um, and also, as we've expanded, we've, we've, we've launched to Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam. Uh, these are very different places. Uh, we need to have a different model, different, different objectives. Um, we also uh, need to test different ways of framing the model. I think, I think this is probably the main takeaway for me from building this, you know, moving from Drank to Jaeger, is that when you have a, a supervised learning model, how you define your your target is, is by an order of magnitude more important than, than anything else, I would say. Um, you know, particularly if it's not a sort of cookie cutter, you know, application of, of machine learning, if it's a sort of slightly um, bespoke uh, solution, I guess. How you define the um, the target? Yeah, super important. So that means you can't just um, 
rely on offline metrics like AUC. If you have two different models that are producing two different things, it's meaningless to, to compare those and those metrics. So you need to be able to test those online, you know, and iterate very quickly. So that, that was a big uh, driving factor for us to build Yoga. Um, control feedback loops, yeah, this is an interesting one. Um, I think what we found with, with Drank was uh, the performance initially was quite good, but then it kind of degraded over time. And what we found was once the model was sort of been refreshed on data that it had itself generated, we got these kind of amplifying effects and, and there were some biases maybe in the model uh, which were getting amplified and it was degrading our performance. Um, so we needed more control um, in order to address this. Uh, I think what you know, part of the, I think the reason for the bias, or a big reason for the bias, was that we had one, we only had one model, so we had to sort of had a sort of monolithic prediction problem, I guess. And we used, with Jaeger, we decided we need to break up this this problem into smaller smaller prediction problems with different models, and then we could control how we actually combine the, the outputs of those different models. Um, so, yeah, finally, similar point, but, you know, as we all know, if you ensemble multiple models, it often performs better than one model. So, yeah, we, we wanted a way to experiment different ways to, to ensemble different models. Uh, so, we've decided we need a lot of models because um, we've got multiple objectives now. Uh, we, are, we already have 18 plus products, uh, many, many cities, uh, and at any one time we'll have dozens of experiments, different versions of the models with different features, you know, we're experimenting. So, um, it's, yeah. When we we built Drank, one model, deployed it, uh, and now we realised, okay, we actually need hundreds, maybe thousands of different models. You know, how, how are we going to um, scale this up? Uh, we need to, you know, for each model, we need to do the feature creation, the training, the deployment, the serving, the assembling, uh, and the experimentation. And how do we manage this big, complex system? Um, and I think. I can't go into all the details of how we did that, um, but I just like to focus on uh, probably the, the most important um, tool that we had, uh, most important sort of abstraction to make this problem more tractable. Uh, it's what we call the feature store or feast. Okay, I'm going to give up on this. Uh, and Good news for all of you is that we open source uh, Feast a few weeks ago. Um, so this is basically our system for it, it's on GitHub. You know. <laughs> um, don't need to take pictures. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, uh, this basically just it doesn't do the feature creation, but it does the feature storage. So it. It's a very useful abstraction we found just obviously for sharing features between different models uh, and for ensuring the consistency of, of features between uh, training and production. Um, I can't take any credit for Feast, it was built by the <coughs> PS platform team here um, and I co probably can't answer any difficult questions but I'm just one happy customer, so that, that's just the perspective I'm going to give you. Um, so, what did Feast allow us to do uh, with Jaeger, in Jaeger? Uh, so this is more or less what we had uh, in the old days with Drank. We just had one sort of monolithic pipeline, raw data, feature engineering, model training, uh, then this would trigger a Trigger the GitLab CI pipeline to deploy the model in order to end up in production. Um, now we have one model. We want to go to hundreds, 
possibly thousands of models. We can't just multiply this you know, a thousand times. So um, this is more or less where we are today. Um, we've, we've broken up this pipeline at the bottom um, with the feature store. So generating the feature engineering, um, if it's, it could be batch you know, in Airflow, or it could be real-time streaming features in Flink or Apache Beam or something. Uh, so that happens as a separate process. It will ingest into the feature store. Uh, and then we can train the models, uh, pulling the data from Beast. Um, then we can run that. We can do the model training in whatever, whatever tool we prefer. Um, and then we have a sort of model store that's analogous to the feature store. Uh, using uh, MLflow currently. Um, and then for deployment, we found that uh, GoCD was, was, was a better fit than uh, GitLab CI. Um, and then on the production side, uh, we needed a system to, to integrate all of, the, all of these models, um, to fetch features, obviously, first, uh, then call the models, uh, then uh, ensemble them. That's uh, Meister, Jaeger Meister. Um, yeah. uh, so that's the ensembling and also the, the logic for the uh, ex experimentation. Um, and then in the center we have Lasso, which is a sort of orchestrated service, which is open source also, or soon to be open source. Uh, but I'm not going to go into the details of this because uh, You'll hear from Jilling in a few minutes, and she'll be able to explain this much better, better than me. Um, so, yeah, you notice we have the feast uh, at the top there, so that's where we need to serve, uh, get, the, get the features uh, in real time for each request, and then um, send them to each of the models uh, asynchronously. Um, so, so what this feast has allowed us to do, it's, it's made it much easier to get real-time features into the model because um, we don't have to worry about the inconsistencies between training and uh, serving. Uh, it makes it easy uh, and natural to share, share features. You define it once, um, you get suggested feast, and then all of these models and other models, different projects, uh, can use those features. Um, and also, another an extension of this is that you can also have another model that is predicting something, uh, maybe some driver levels fraud score, for instance. Uh, that can then be ingested in, into Feast as a feature, and then that's a feature for our models in allocation. So I think this is it's really helped uh, improve the collaboration in the data science team. You know, the guys that are building this driver forward model, uh, you know, they might be in Jakarta, but we're in Singapore. But Feast allows us to collaborate in a very productive way. Um, uh, because we've we've broken up this pipeline at the bottom, uh, each each stage, you know, we can choose the, the tools that make sense and this has made it, you know, this much more modular approach has made it much easier to scale to, to dozens and hundreds of models. Um, and then finally it's a, we found it's yeah, pretty performant. Uh, so this is the serving agency. This is when we first rolled out Feast for Jaeger. Uh, we were monitoring the the latency of fetching these features, and as you can see, it kind of dropped dropped off a cliff, which was very good news for us. We were having a lot of timeouts before, we moved to face, we solved that problem. Uh, I can't give you a good reason why we managed <laughs> to achieve this, but kind of my point is, you know, before this, you know, part of the reason why this was so slow is that we, me and Jared, the data scientists, were manually loading features into a big table we were using as a data scientist, you don't really want to be, you don't want to be doing that. So Feast gets the division of responsibilities, uh, correct, I think. So, 
as a data scientist, I don't have to worry about the, the serving agency. Um, I just get my features and I'm happy. Uh, so this all added up, I think it's, it's had a lot of uh, success, a lot of business impact. Um, I would say the one biggest thing, most important thing, uh, as I mentioned, is being able to, to try out different models, different framings of a problem, in terms of different targets in, in the supervised learning model, uh, and then it quickly, easily put that into production, see, see the uplift. Um, so, yeah, this, we've got a lot of uh, appreciation from the, from the business, uh, from our bosses, which is nice. Um, I think, obviously, they care about the, the uplift in the, in the metrics, um, but I think they also recognize that we've built a way um, robust system that is going to scale um, with the business, uh, and as our needs change, um, you're not going to have to re, you know, rebuild again. So, yeah. That's it for me. I think we can. We have time for a few questions now before we move on to doing. Uh, Yes, hi, thanks for the presentation. Uh, just wondering, could you give an example of what the model actually outputs and a few examples of its inputs? Uh, yeah, so uh, Gerard, Gerard mentioned the main sort of features we have, uh, you know, they, they, they tend to be, you know, driver, driver level features or customer level features or, or the sort of the, Geo, geo type features associated with that trip. Um, so they're the inputs we're, we have a lot. Um, I can't go into all of them. Um, the output, yeah, I mean, it, it just depends on what the business metric we're optimizing for is. So we have different, a lot of different models optimizing for different objectives. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, the number of completed bookings, you know, just converting the booking is a, is a big one, uh, but there's lots of other things like um, You want to reduce fake TPS or? Yeah, the, the, we have, fraud is, 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 it's been a big problem, uh, drivers, um, a lot of our drivers seem to like uh, Pokemon Go a lot, but they, they ghost their location uh, for some reason, uh, so we're trying to Obviously, that is influencing the marketplace in a, in a, in a very bad way. Uh, so we, we tried very hard to, to deal with that quite successfully. Um, yeah, there's really yeah. Whatever the business says, they care about this week. That, that that's what the uh, trick is. Thanks. I have a couple of questions. So before you were doing drunk, uh, you were saying that it, it improved your operations. What were you doing before? Like, what did it improve upon? That's the first question. The second one is, uh, what breaks the most? What, what features break the model the most? Because you were saying that uh, things change really fast. After a few months, uh, things stop working. Well, what's the, which features are responsible? Um, it, it was just problem formulation. We tried, we were not looking at the right metric to optimize for. Um, we thought that the acceptance rate of drivers is a, is a good indication of our network efficiency. Uh, but really what happened later was that we, uh, we found that in order to improve the network efficiency holistically, we, used, we have to look at different objectives and metrics and have certain constraints on them. So uh, that is how we differentiated with Jaeger. Um, Some of the examples of um, real-time changes are, like Peter mentioned in the talk, it's, it's about driver behavior changes. Sometimes, uh, if a driver is having a bad day because of, uh, it might be an issue with his uh, mobile phone or something where he's not able to accept proper orders, 
that might that might lead to poor uh, uh, driver statistics, and we don't want such things to uh, get, uh, get the drivers deprioritized enough. Yeah, I think, yeah, as we mentioned, forward is, is a big one that is always fast changing, it's always an arms race. Um, yeah, I think we're in danger of overrunning already. So. All right, thank you, Peter, thank you, Joe. Everyone, please, give a round of applause. Uh, sorry, I cut the question short. We have four sharings, and we're halfway through, and it's already 8 p.m. Next, we have Zilink, who will be sharing about Lasso about uh, Gojek's so uh, service orchestration. Thank you, thank you everyone. I'm Jilin. Um So just like how I did Usher in front, and then I'm talking to you now, and I'm probably doing cleanup. I specialize in the end-to-end -end deployment of uh, machine learning. <laughs> So my team does not only um, deployment of models, but also um, the building up of a platform for the data scientists to bring their models to production in as fast a manner as possible. Yeah. So today I'm going to talk to you about um, building complex machine learning workflows um, here at Gojek. Yeah. So I hope that sounds slightly exciting to you guys. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about model deployment, right? Um, when you think about putting models into deployment, what is it that you think about? Sorry, I need to find the mouse. Yeah. So you expect that with your model um, up somewhere in the cloud, you receive some sort of request, and then it will return some sort of response, right? And this would go through some sort of model. Something like this, right? So request into model and response. So a lot of uh, serverless uh, machine learning um, deployment solutions, they focus on this. You can deploy a model and it focuses on outputting whatever the model, um, as in whatever the model outputs. So it's just in and out, right? But realistically, what you'd be having is something like this, right? You would have some sort of pre-processing of the request and that goes to the model, and then that, that response would have to be post-processed before it's returned to whoever is querying the service. But it's not usually this simple, right? This is like, I don't know, maybe you build this in university or something, but this is, this is hardly ever good enough, right? So um, a, a common pattern is that you would have some sort of um, features, right, in some DB somewhere. These would be batch features. And you retrieve this during the pre-processing stage. And these would be past the model. And then the response would be post-processed. And this would be returned to the person that's querying it. So this still looks pretty simple, pretty doable. You could do it in a really small microservice. But then it gets more complex. What if your model requires some sort of fallback logic? What if your model is something that's complex and could possibly take very long? So for instance, if let's say you had um, some sort of deep learning model that couldn't possibly return a response um, within 60 ms, 99% of the time, right? What do you do with the responses that fail to be um, created on time? You need some sort of fallback logic, right? And this fallback logic would have to go inside your app. And then what if you have two models, right? What if you have two models and you want to um, do some sort of traffic splitting between the two? This is actually a very common pattern. Um, let's say if you wanted to segment your population, you wanted um, population A to get um, results from a model that you are, <coughs> sorry, a base model, and you want some test population to get um, results from a model that you are experimenting on, right? And then what if you had even more models, right? And it's not even traffic splitting this time. You want to ensemble them, right? You want your request to go to each of these models. You need to run some sort of post-processing step to ensemble these models' outputs before you output a response um, to the user. So what I'm trying to say here, right, is that it's never, 
deploying a model to production is never as simple as putting a model in a microservice, in a cloud, and expecting that what it produces is good enough um, for whatever application you're doing, right? It looks, it'll probably look something like this in the end, right? It gets, it gets complicated pretty fast. So case in point, um, what Peter and Jawad showcased to you earlier with Lasso. Oh, sorry, not Lasso, I mean Jaeger. I'm too excited about my own thing, but yeah. So if you looked at um, what they had, right, um, what they had was um, multiple models, some sort of experimentation service, they had um, feature getting, they had post-processing, they had ensembling, right? And if you think about building something like this, sorry, Okay, I'll talk about that later. So it's very difficult to think about um, a model in production as a model. You have to think about it as a predictive unit. So this is a term that was coined by um, the developers behind Selden, right? Who is building, who built something similar, but it's way more featureful. So what um, I'm trying to say here is that um, when you want predictions from something, that something is usually not a model, but a system. A system of um, different entities doing different things, right? And can you imagine if you built this entire system within a monolithic application, right? All that complexity would become something that's incredibly hard to handle even for software engineers, right? Much less data scientists. And you want data scientists to not have to grapple with code um, as much as possible. I mean, you want them to code, right? They need to code to make their models, but you don't want them to be building um, massive, not even, massive microservices sounds a bit strange, um, large services um, to house their models, right? So the problem with something like this is that a lot of the code ends up being boilerplate, right? Um, you end up reusing the same code across your applications, and then it becomes very hard to, um, make changes in one of them and not have to propagate them across all those other applications. Um, it's also very difficult to, to um, orchestrate all these flows um, within a single application because it's not immediately visible um, what each part is feeding to another. Right? Um, and it also means that you're locked into a single language in this project. Right? which in machine learning can be quite a handicap, right? You would want, like for instance, um, let's say you've trained an XGBoost model, right? Um, usually you'd serve it with, nowadays you can serve it with anything, but um, back when this was built, um, you, could, you could only serve it with like Java or Python, while the rest of our, the rest of the parts of our application we wanted to build in Go, right? So it was, it was difficult, right? What's the next slide? So, logically, what you want to do is break it up. You want these entities to live within their own services um, and interact with each other somehow, right? But the thing is that when you break, when you broken it up, how are you going to define the flow, right? Where does it? Where does the logic for um, how? this input flows into this input, and how um, the request flows to all three models, where does that live? Do you put it inside each of the applications? The problem with that is that you have to, it becomes very difficult to make changes. You make one, you add one model, you have to change that model, you have to change this, you have to change that, and it becomes extremely difficult to maintain this system. And that's not what we want. So enter Lasso, um, which is something we built to as a as a solution to this problem. It's a microservice orchestrator, which is an extremely big word, big word and very fancy sounding. But um, I hope it explains why it does. Someone, right? So it's supposed to orchestrate flows between um, different microservices. In this case, would be services um, that comprise a predictive unit. Yeah. So by orchestrating these microservices, 
as you can see, Lasso would have access to each of the services within the predictive unit. It's able to execute workflows similar to how um, your airflow DAG would be like, right? You define some sort of direct acyclic graph, your request would flow through this graph, and you get some sort of response. So what Lasso is, is that, um, sorry, Lasso is comprised of workflows. Right, so workflows are, as I described to you, um, a, a directed <laughs> acyclic graph of tasks. So there's a bag of tasks that um, Lasso is supposed to execute. And all of these tasks have access to an in memory JSON store. And when a request mm -hmm. comes in, Lasso will orchestrate um, the, Lasso will execute the tasks. Um, as they are required to, as in whenever, okay, let me, let me, let me show you later. Um, so let's not execute these tasks in turn, um, either synchronously or asynchronously, to produce some sort of response. So what will look something like this, right? You have some sort of, op some set of options, so you're able to set um, which endpoint you want it to be at. Um, you're able to set a global timeout, which has proved to be very useful for data scientists. And you are able to define a bag of tasks, um, as I showed in the previous diagram. So what is a task? So a task is basically um, something that does something if the conditions are met. Right? So the way we've designed it is that you don't draw a graph. You define a task that only executes when certain triggers are fired. Right? So it's able to depend on either the content of the request other task statuses. So instance, for instance, if an upstream task has succeeded or failed, and also other task outputs, right? And the tasks, we have a variety of tasks that are currently built into Lasso. Um, we have tasks that can echo values, that can make HTTP calls, and also execute some sort of lambda, lambda function to transform um, the requests or the outputs of other tasks. So it looks something like this, right? So you have the task type, the configuration of the task, you have additional inputs to the task, um, output path that you want to put it in, and then the conditions to run. This is very extremely important. And then um, if you want this task to be exit, then there will be an exit flag. Yeah. So how does this whole thing solve the problem, right? Thanks to Lasso, microservices can have distinct roles. Right? You don't have to have a microservice um, do a bunch of things and do a bunch of things in a media code way. Right? You can write um, you can write a task that sorry, a service that processes data in a language that processes data well, for instance, Python. Right? You don't have to write it in like Go, which is like ripping your hair out, right? <laughs> and then there's also an encapsulation. The microservices don't necessarily have to know about each other, right? Only Lasso knows about them. So they can, they can basically heck care about the world around them. All they care about is whatever they get and whatever they have to return, right? <coughs> and also, similar services can be used for other predictive units. So instances of services <laughs> that can be reused to be like feature getters, um, Okay, mainly feature getters. Yeah. Um, yeah. And of course, there's no dependency on a single framework like or language, as I've explained in the first point. Right? You can have a predictive unit that comprises of, of microservices that are in Go, in Python, in Java, whatever um, your developer is comfortable with, or whatever is best suited for that task. Yeah. It also means that it's extremely easy to edit and iterate on workflows because you don't have to write additional code and the configuration of workflow sits outside of the definition of those services. Yep. Oh yeah, and boilerplate can be moved into Lasso. So for instance, we are planning to move um, feature getting into Lasso so that you don't have to write a service for that anymore. So it'd be a task. Yep, so Lasso brings to the table some other nice things. Um, it's fast and it's scalable. Um, it's extremely lightweight. Um, 
it sits at the heart of, of Jaeger, so I know at least that it's able to handle the, the load that the Indonesia marketplace um, puts on it, right? So that's, that's pretty impressive. Um, also, because it's written in Go, it can be compiled to a single <coughs> executable that's very, very easy to deploy, right? Um, we have a Helm chart for it, so all you have to do is to Helm install, provide it with a config map that has the workflow specification, and it works. That's it. <coughs> yeah, and then if you've seen from the previous slides, we also support Go templates, which will be similar to your Jinja template thing, right? Um, it allows you to have logic inside your workflows, right? Um, so you're able to do things like input and output validation, you're able to transform requests and responses, and so on, yeah. And the nice thing about the workflow sitting outside of the <coughs> service definition is that you're able to version the workflow separately from the services, yeah. There are some caveats though, like it's not, it's not all sunshine and roses in Nestle land. Um, there are trade-offs between la latency and type safety. So I mentioned the, the JSON store earlier, right? Um, the thing is that JSON can be very expensive to parse, it takes very long, right? Um, so what Nestle has done is that um, it opts for a lazy JSON parser that doesn't really care about um, how well-formed your JSON is. In exchange, it's able to pass the JSON extremely quickly. Yeah. So um, to handle validation, you have to write it in the Lambda instead. Yeah. Um, it can also be memory intensive because we use an in-memory JSON store. Um, Go templates are also not intuitive to write. If you guys have written Jinja templating, it's, it's the same. Um, and yeah, most can get pretty big. And also, it's currently HTTP only. It's not cool, right? You need to handle GRPC, right? Yeah. So I think that's it. Um, I have a final slide with my GitHub on it because I didn't know what to put in the final slide. Uh, but yeah, I hope you enjoy what I have to say. Um, does anyone have any questions? Oh, okay. Oh, okay, I have another question. Okay. Um, so I'll hand it off to Jared, um, who has a very important talk to say to you all. If you guys have any questions, just hit me up. Yeah, I remember like we'll have we're not going to close shop immediately, so um, you know Peter and Java are going to be there. Jinx is going to be there. They're already um, charismatic speakers. Um, but I will say this: that this is the first time I'm hearing the official version of why Jaeger is named Jaeger. I always assume that the team like to drink. That's why they call it Drank and Jaeger. Like, so okay, yeah, let's go with that. Pacific Rim. Um, okay, cool. I am actually going to pivot a little bit and talk more about. Thank you so much. Um, burning out data science and why is this an important topic is because most who what's the most important thing when you are trying to to launch a data science product? People. What is that sound? Um, it's people. Who said that? Thank you. Um, and the reason why I say people is because honestly, like the talent pool here in Singapore is and Southeast Asia is you know and to a to a large extent the world like is very thin like. You don't support people, they're going to burn out. They burn out, you don't get data science. Cool? So, a little bit more about me. Um, um, my name is Jairi Tan. I, it's pronounced Jairate without the T. Uh, here is my contact info if you want to get in touch with me later. Um, my current favorite animal is the penguin um, because they're just so cute. Look at that one. Um, even, even real life penguins are very cute. So why, why do I care about um, burning out as a data scientist? Well, my task here at Gojek is simple. I support 46 or so uh, data scientists, and I'm here to help them in their career and to make sure that all of them feel supported by the organization. My background is very all over the place. Uh, uh, I used to work uh, as an economist at MAS, um, if you've heard of it. It's right across the street. I'm a bond breaker. <laughs> uh, I have strong opinions about the scholarship system. Please come talk to me. <laughs> uh, I worked at Flipboard, which is an app that has since um, gone on to do to greener pastures. I was the first data scientist that worked on churn models, data hack, uh, growth hacking. At Facebook, I started out as a data scientist on groups. Then I transitioned into a software engineering role on A/B testing. 
Then I quit and started my own consulting business, published a paper in The Lancet on Bayesian Method Analysis, uh, and now I'm here supporting my teammates, um, and I've, I, I, I have to say, like, these people are on point. You know, I've, I've been around the world, that's a song from the 80s, in case you didn't know. No? You know what? Uh, and uh, I have to say that the talent here at Gojek is like stellar, um, and I've really been impressed by all of my teammates. Um, so I'm living proof of the fact that you can have many careers and you can reinvent yourself, um, even if you're not Madonna. Uh, so what happened to me at Facebook? I, I burned out. In 2014, my best friend died, and I didn't take any time off because I was I was young. I was back then. I was in my 20s. Um, I still am. Uh, <laughs> um, and I was just like powering through, right? And then in 2015, Facebook grows huge. Like that's when they had a doubling in size of headcount at Facebook. Uh, by 2016, in January, I was physically exhausted. And in 2016, in March, I actually had to take two months off of work. And in November of that year, I left Facebook. And then soon after, trained as a yoga instructor, focusing on mindfulness, and then started my own consulting business. Now, why, what is burnout and how do you recognize it? There are three points here. It's exhaustion, cynicism, and attachment. Oh, excuse me, exhaustion, cynicism, and feeling in ineffective and unaccomplished. So, exhaustion is pretty obvious. Um, I put a picture of Yoda here, because I think Yoda's cute too. Um, but you can read the symptoms by yourself, but it's important to know that exhaustion can refer to both physical and emotional exhaustion. So if you feel like you're irritable and like that you're short with your colleagues, that's an example of um, uh, exhaustion. Um, cynicism and detachment refers to a lack of enjoyment when you engage with your work. You start to feel pessimism, you start to isolate yourself. I did this a lot at Facebook towards the end of my career there. Um, and detachment refers to things like I go in late or I don't really like want to engage my colleagues. Um, the last point is feeling ineffective, and note that feeling ineffective can also be a cause of being ineffective. So it becomes like a vicious circle. Um, so congratulations, if you exhibit 55% of these symptoms, you may be suffering from burnout. And that's not a good thing, because burnout equals attrition. I mean, from an organizational perspective, but for you, burnout means burnout, and that's bad too. <laughs> so, um, why do data scientists burn out? And I think that there's something unique about burning out as a data scientist, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a couple of hypotheses, precisely six. One, this field is full of media hype. So there is a myth that data science can do everything, but it, in reality, it can do you know, some things really well, like it can play Go but it cannot really stand in for product or design, which I think we often, as data scientists, get involved in conversations where you know, our PMs or our directors ask us, like, so should we launch or not? And then you're like, um, <laughs> hey, yeah. yes. <laughs> cool, um, hypothesis two, it's a lack of clarity about what we do. And this has to do with media hype, but it also has to do with the fact that we're a relatively young field. And we do so much. We do machine learning, we do statistical inference. I love, like, I train as a statistician. That's, that's where I, I think I shine at. Software engineering, we do data visualization, and also sometimes we're expected to, to tell stories. And not all of us are going to, and this is not an exhaustive list here, not all of us are going to be good at all parts of this, um, of, of this list. Hypothesis three. Data is where product and engineering disagree. Because engineers tend to be realists and product managers tend to be idealists. And data science often gets caught in the middle. How many of you have fixed the logging bug? No? Oh my gosh, really? Y'all, you all are li living the life. I have fixed a logging bug so often where like the PMs define one thing as one, one as something and the engineers just like increment the wrong part of the app. You know, and like all the metrics look crazy, all the results look crazy, and then like I'm the one that has to like chase it down. That's where product and engineering, that's an example of where product and engineering really disagree. I'll leave some time for questions later. Um, this point is important to know that the data science life cycle is very, very different from the product life cycle or the engineering life cycle. Because why we have actually, engineering, you tend to go from prototype to implementation to maintenance, to deployment, maintenance, and improvement. 
But for us, there is a front-loaded analysis portion, right? Because we're not going to execute unless we have a fairly good idea that it's going to produce good results. And how many of you have been involved in daily sprint stand-ups where, where you're expected to just say, uh, I'm still researching. Um, same as yesterday. Yeah. Oh, right, right. Um, very exhausting, right? <laughs> the other thing to note is that we're often often by the organization. If you work at a startup, the data science person is usually not the second or third hire. It's usually like the 20th hire. And then when you get there, like the engineers kind of look at you like you're a bit crazy, you know? Like, um, and when you report into engineering, you are reviewed and ranked against engineering standards, which tend to ignore the front-loaded analysis portion. And when you report into product, you're, reported against, uh, you're reviewed and ranked against product standards. And who knows what those are? I, I'm sorry. Um, I, love my, I love my product managers and everything, but sometimes I like, don't really see eye to eye. So who advocates for data scientists? That could be another cause of right now. Oh, excuse me. Uh, the last thing is the relative lack of mentors and managers. And I think really, when I was at Facebook, this was the number one reason. Like, because data science was such a young field then, I, like, I was 12, you know? And um, um, I'm not 22. Um, and um, my, my managers were just 14, you know? I'm, I'm exaggerating. My manager was actually younger than, than me at that point. And, you know, bless his soul, but he, he tried his best. And, you know, the issue here is that a lot of us data scientists, we have an obsession with being technical, which somehow has become, has come to mean, like, I, I know how to use deep learning. Um, but we don't realize that in order to leverage ourselves, we need to leverage ourselves in terms of talent rather than technology, right? Because when do you really encounter a problem that, like, deep learning or, like, whatever the... Like, I, I come from statistics, so like right now everything is Bayesian, right? Like, when, when, when does that Bayesian approach like buy you, you know, the 20% win? Not really. <clears throat> so, give, these are my hypotheses. How do I think that we can prevent burnout? The number one thing is to set expectations, right? I, when I work with my team here at Gojek, I continually help them to remind stakeholders that data science cannot answer every question. In particular, don't get data science to answer really hard business questions that are at the intersection of product engineering, design, and UX research. We are a voice at this table. Yes, I agree. We can provide a lot of valuable insights. We can provide a lot of valuable strategies on how to grow. But we cannot solve everything. Uh, um, the other thing to note is that we, uh, we, we have to be very cognizant of where we are in the data science life cycle. Which means that when we are in the research or analysis phase, we have to really be aggressive at telling other people to, you know, give us some space to breathe, to say it nicely. I was about to use like a, a, an ex expletive. Um, <laughs> and each phase requires different skills, different cadence of check-in, and different project management techniques. We start to answer very broad and open questions at first. Data scientists answer broad, open questions at first that kind of converge on an implementation solution, right? And we have to, to be able to recognize this and advocate for ourselves. Um, another thing that you could probably do is to ask for organizational clarity. As I said, being a data scientist at an early startup sucks because you're too late to be founder, but too early to be a comfortable employee. <laughs> <clears throat> um, a lot of you are laughing because probably it's true. Uh, and being a data scientist at a big company can suck because you're often caught between product management and engineering, but you have none of the authority. And you may also have to compete with other data teams like data engineering or product anal analytics. I think in the face of this, you can ask yourself what data science as an organization and your teammates, what you all can uniquely do and focus on those things. And once you get clarity on what it is that you should do, other people should listen to you when you are the authority on that. And I think that this requires a lot of, 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 of self-awareness and the ability to advocate for yourself. Um, the last thing, I think it's the last thing, um, but uh, I, I'm just crossing my fingers and hoping that this is the last slide. Sorry, I'm not putting my, sh my foot in my mouth. Um, is to find mentors. 
Um, you find mentors inside the organization, so you get more senior data, data scientists within your organization to mentor you. But you also, outside the organization, use these meetups to find counterparts that you can bounce ideas off of. And, and that's what I hope that you will do with DSSG tonight. Um, but the more hidden and more valuable thing, I think, is because we're such a young field, you may not necessarily get mentors with, with that much more experience than you. You know, as I said, I'm only 15. Like, they're not that, wait, wrong. Um, <laughs> I'm only 22, yeah. Like, uh, and this field is only, what, six years old? Like, who else is here to like, help me? Um, so one of the ways that you can overcome that is to become a mentor yourself. And peer mentorship, I think, is where you start to learn a lot. And that's actually how I got started in this business, by helping my teammates um, and, 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 and shepherding them through, through tough times. And in doing so, I built trust, and they also mentored me when I needed them. So these, this is not an exhaustive list, by the way, of why burnout happens um, and how to prevent it. But uh, I'm, I'm hoping that it will spark a good conversation. Um, and if you're interested in being a manager or a team lead here at Gojek, please come email me. This is my name, jai at gojek.com. Um, and we have one last video, but I feel like the, the sound is a little off. And we're, oh, it's all right now. Uh, well, um, we can watch this video, but before that, do you have any questions for either me or Juling? Can you give an example of when um, you were asked to answer a stupid, sorry, complex, <laughs> complex business question that yeah. really wasn't well posed? I'm not covered by a Facebook NDA anymore, right? <laughs> so I worked on groups, right? And one of the last products I worked on was a group app. The standalone groups app. How many of you have heard of it? Exactly! <laughs> right? Like, um, <laughs> because then they would just like, basically every week they'd be like, oh, did we hear my tricks? And then they'd turn to us and be like, so should we launch or not? I'm like, I don't know. It depends on what you think the business value of this is and whether you think that having a standalone groups app is part of your entire strategy of having individual products be broken out into their own separate apps. And then they'd be like, should we launch or not? <laughs> like, you know, you get into those weird like conversations which are very like on loop where, and you have to start recognizing this, right? When you are asked to behave like a product manager, like to make product decisions because your product manager is <laughs> not bold. Not bold. Um, you should you should find a way to figure out you know and say like hey like I have provided you with the best information that I can. We need to have a multifaceted approach to decision making at this company because you can't simply just look at me and say like data is all the answers. We often do. I mean we're we're, we're geniuses, but but we often don't. Any other questions before we play this video? Uh, yes. Sorry, I, I had a question about Lasso. Um, yes, Jilling. So it's regarding pre-processing. Very often, it's a part that actually is duplicated. You have pre-processing. Uh, when you're training a model the first time, and then you have pre-processing for live requests. And uh, I'm not entirely sure whether you were using the same code, the same components, uh, basically in Feast or, or in, in live pre-processing. Oh yeah, excellent question. That's where uh, Feast comes in. Please uh, like and star us on GitHub. <laughs> um, okay, so the way Feast is able to help you um, in this part of the machine learning workflow is that um, we do our pre-processing outside of the app, right? It's done inside the stream. So in our case, we do it in Beam, right? So if it's real-time data, it passes through that stream, it's transformed, and ideally what comes out of it is a pure feature. It's whatever you need for your model. So um, whatever goes through that stream would ideally be something that could be shared across multiple predictive units. Yeah, so does that answer your question? Absolutely, thank yeah. you. Okay, thank you. We're going to play this last video and then um, um, uh, hand it back to the organization, uh, organizers of DSSG. How do I play this video?
Yeah, but there's no button here. Oh, okay. Sorry. Let me guess. You love making mobile apps. Bitcoin predictors and flipping bird games. That's cute. Me? I'm a super app. Yeah, that's right. Super. Name's Gojek. Baby app killer. How am I super? Hmm. School's in. Ready to learn some stranger things? Here we go. Welcome to Indonesia, the crown jewel of the east. 18,000 plus islands, but 22 billion minutes wasted in traffic. And the land of me, Goja, super app. Me, my transport, delivery, food, and Paris, massage. Ooh, nice. Payment, bills, rewards, shopping, business. You get the point. I do 100 million orders every month. Wait, what? No. Yes, you heard me. 18 plus products for 261 million people. Who are you gonna call? Me. I do it all faster than you can be with Scotty. Still with me? Good. Think your linguist? Say, Makasimas. To one of the largest JRuby, Java, and Go clusters in Asia. One in four Indonesians have me in their pocket, even your grandma. Every day, my riders cover 16.5 million kilometers. That's more than 21 round trips to the moon. Does your app go where no man's gone before? I didn't think so. Oh, sorry, Neil. Most importantly, 2.5 million people rely on me for their income every day. I help fill bellies, run businesses, and move an entire nation. I know. Where do I get the energy? Wait, now going to other countries too? Vietnam, Singapore, Thailand, and Philippines? You ready? Now, what were you saying? Right, you're looking for a job. Say something super? Come help us, Slay. for joining us for the meetup today and of course thank you to Gojek for sporting venue, food, having their speakers share with us. How many of you here have actually looked at the Feast GitHub? Who is the last committer? <laughs> well, it's your very own speaker. So, yes! so if you want to find out more about Feast, check, uh, talk to her. Gojek also has an excellent medium blog. Go check it out. They have tech, they talk about life, they talk about culture, everything about that. So, I mean, I'm sure the speakers will be hanging around a while as well so just do whatever you want if you want to head home you're tired it is has been a very packed meetup with a lot of content so after that that's it thank you everyone <laughs>